Genies, it's Fisher with exciting news. The Weekly Genie, the official newsletter of Extreme Genes, is here. It's your Monday morning briefing on what's happening in the world of genealogy and family history and on Extreme Genes. Get all the details of jaw-dropping stories of discovery and keep up with the latest techniques in family history research. Get to know more about your favorite Extreme Genes personalities, and it's free. Sign up for The Weekly Genie now at ExtremeGenes.com or the Extreme Genes Facebook page. It's been this way for generations. Dates in the Bible don't quite match the marriage certificate. Uh oh. This show just keeps spreading out. Hey, it's Fisher here, your radio root sleuth on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. It's Extreme Genes, America's family history show, and very excited to now be heard in Maui, Hawaii on KAOI AM and FM. Got to give a little shout out to John Detz and his team there. So proud to be part of their great weekend lineup in Maui. A lot of great family history, of course, in Hawaii. Well, welcome to the show. We got a lot of great things going on today. Maureen Taylor is going to be here a little bit later on in about eight minutes. She is the photo detective. She can take your unmarked photo, somebody you don't even know who it belongs to, right? And just by looking at a hat or maybe a hemline or something about the photograph itself, she can help you figure out who that is a picture of. It's going to be a great interview coming up later on in the show. And then after that, we're going to talk to Andrew Cray. He's a senior researcher at the New England Historic Genealogical Society. And with all the recognition of the Revolutionary War going on this month, we thought we'd talk to him about the legendary Molly Pitcher. Real person, conglomeration of several. Of course, the story revolves around a woman who helped the American troops in the Battle of Monmouth, June 28th, 1778, bringing pitchers of water and also firing cannons at the enemy. He's done a little research to kind of figure out who this person might have actually been. We'll have that for you later on in the show. But right now, let's check in with Boston and my good friend, the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. It's David Allen Lambert. Hello, David. Greetings from Beantown. Fish, how are you doing this week? Awesome. Very excited, by the way, to have started our weekly genie newsletter. And uh, th- this is a, a way for people to get to know us, the personalities on the show, a little bit more. Learn a few more things about doing your family history research. And also link to some great interviews of the past and the present week that you might not have heard before. Great. Well, I hope I can put in some surprises in the newsletter, too, and keep the readers informed. Well, looking forward to having you be a part of it. Well, you know, as chief genealogist, there are a couple other people with that title. And one is my good friend, Daniel Horowitz, who is with MyHeritage.com, who gave me some exciting new news. If you're a MyHeritage user, you may know about Super Search. Well, a new function is called Super Search Alerts. So when you originally did your input and you got your matches, you didn't get anything. Well, now your information is already there. Super Search Alerts will will, quote, alert you when a match comes up. So this is a great new advantage for my heritage users. One of the most interesting things in recent years are apps that are made for your smartphone. And of course, for the genealogists, there are plenty of them. One of them that I like is Billion Graves app that allows you to go take a photograph of a gravestone, have it uploaded, the GPS, it's fabulous. So if you're a user of that, I would say, why don't you volunteer this weekend? In conjunction with the Boy Scouts of America, they are starting a project on July 30th, all day, called Finding the Fallen. They want you to go to your local and your national cemeteries using the Billion Graves app, and you can go out and capture the images and locations of gravestones for America's veterans. So I think this is a wonderful way of spending a time with your family, get out there with the app, and capture some history. Boy, that sounds like a great service project. Hey, I want to give an early birthday wish to Mick Jagger from the Rolling Stones. We'll be having a birthday coming up this week. I don't know if you know this, but two years ago, he became a great-grandfather. Yeah, 2014. He's 73 years young this week, and he's got more news. Oh, that he does. Sometime next year, that great-grandchild will have a new great-uncle or great-aunt because (laughs) Mick's girlfriend is expecting a baby in 2017. Yeah, she's 29, 
And uh, so Mick's going to be a dad again two years after having a great grandkid. This is unbelievable. Has this ever happened before? Probably in some of the seated houses of Europe in the Middle Ages. But <laughs> it's almost biblical, don't you think? I uh, definitely think so. And this kind of leads me to my next news oh, no, story. Wait, wait a minute. Before you leave the yep. Stones, okay. yep. Ronnie Wood two months ago had twins. <sighs> so it's like the Stones are starting all over again. Oh, my goodness. A rolling stone gathers no moss, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so, other news. Recently, in Worcester, Massachusetts, Goldie Michelson died. She was the oldest American. Now the title goes to Adele Dunlap of Hunterdon County, New Jersey, who is now the oldest person in America, born on December 12, 1902. She likes to lie about her age. So when they asked her how it feels to be 113, she replied, no, I'm 104. So, <laughs> you know, maybe she could say she's some fraction of 29. Yeah, right. Well, it makes sense to go from Goldie to Locks. Yeah. And if you've ever wondered who had the best hair back in the colonial period, George Washington, John Adams, now you can find out. The Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University is putting on display the hair of Washington, Adams, Jefferson, John Quincy Adams, and Andrew Jackson in their Museum, Presidential Archives, Letters, Hair, and Fossils exhibit. That's in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and you can see it through July 29th. Sounds like fun. Now, my next tech tip kind of ties into social media, but it's also an old-fashioned low-tech tip, if you will. Mm. I use genealogical programs, and one of the ones I use is Roots magic. And I have found that as I update the family genealogy this summer, I've been adding in contact information. I just don't mean the email address and the social media link to their Facebook page, their old fashioned mailing address. What? So yeah, can you believe that snail mail would be something I would want to collect? But think about it. It's a genealogical step. Where were they living? It's a residence. We don't have phone books anymore. The censuses are done every 10 years. Why not ask people where they're living? And then, of course, you know, if you mail them a copy, it's also a nice way to keep in touch, especially during the holidays, sending the old-fashioned traditional holiday cards. You mean through the mail? The mail, yeah. Remember you, hmm. you lick the envelope and put yeah, a stamp on right, it? Right, right, yes. a little yes. blue box? I recall that. <laughs> the NEHGS free guest user database this week are three towns in Vermont from the 18th and 19th century, the towns of Dover, Fairfax, and Hardwick. As always, you can get a free user database account by just going to AmericanAncestors.org. Well, that's about all I have for this week. Fish, I'll talk to you next week. Enjoy your summer. All right. Thanks so much, David. Always great talking to you. And coming up next, we're going to talk to Maureen Taylor. She is the photo detective. How do you tell what era a photo is from or maybe who it was? She's going to give you a few tips on that coming up in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. This segment's been brought to you by 23andMe.com DNA. Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that meet FDA standards. Standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com. Provide your saliva sample from home and mail it back to a CLIA certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. Well, Genies, my personal family history researcher who sends me new information day and night has sent me some incredible new records and newspaper stories lately. Hi, it's Fisher, and the name of that researcher, by the way, is MyHeritage.com. It's the hardest working service in genealogy, looking for records of your family 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yes, even while you're sleeping. How does it work? MyHeritage uses hundreds of algorithms to match your ancestors to over 5 billion records from around the 
world and with 97% accuracy. That means no more wasting time figuring out whether or not a match really is a match. I hear from listeners all the time who are shocked with how much information is accurately found and then passed along. And now my heritage will translate your ancestors' names into English or any other language you like from foreign records. In fact, it works with over 40 languages. No one else does this. Whether you're a beginner or seasoned researcher, you need MyHeritage.com. You know, everybody needs a place of their own to plant their family tree, preferably one that no one else can mess with and only you can control. That perfect place is Roots Magic. Roots Magic has been a family history standard for years, and now Roots Magic 7 is on the market. It's an award-winning genealogical software program which makes researching, organizing, and sharing your family history easy. You can start from scratch or import data from other software or even family search. Roots Magic also automatically finds records relating to your ancestors from MyHeritage, FamilySearch, and soon Ancestry and Find My Past. You can use it to create beautiful charts, reports, and books. And have you ever thought about making your own family history website? Roots Magic can make that happen too. And of course, there are free videos, guides, and technical support to help you along. Isn't it about time you planted your family tree? Whether you're a beginning genie or experienced professional, Roots Magic is the perfect tool for you. Hey, welcome back to Extreme Genes, America's family history show on ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. This segment is brought to you by LegacyTree.com. You know, over my three plus decades of researching my family, one of the joys of becoming the point person for pretty much every branch of the family, not only on my side, but on my wife's, is that periodically people send me stuff, photographs, old photographs of all types, uh, CDVs, the cabinet cards, Ambro types. I mean, you go through the entire list, but often these things are not identified. And that's where my next guest comes in. She is the photo detective. She's Maureen Taylor, very well known within the industry. Maureen, welcome to Extreme Genes. This is long overdue. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Thank you so much for having me on the show. I am just delighted to have you. And, you know, I was looking at your website and how you go about things. And obviously, everything about genealogy is detective work. And really, to me, that's that's the fun and the joy and the excitement, because anything you actually find, you really get to keep forever. But oftentimes, we come across these photographs with no names on them and no way of identifying who they might be. And this is what you've been doing now for some time. Give us a little idea about how you got started in this. Oh, gee. <laughs> ancient history. But but really, I, I credit my mother because she always showed us the family photos. And I don't have a lot of old family photos. That's my big secret. I have a lot of t early 20th century pictures, but not too many before that. But she used to drag out the boxes and keep us entertained and tell us stories about these people. And, you know, I didn't think anything of it, and I became interested in genealogy as a young kid. And then I got out of college and realized that, hey, you can actually put the two things together. Mm -hmm. That family history and photography go together quite well. And no one was really doing that when I started the photo detective business. Now there's, you know, a lot of people who understand the importance of that picture and the power of it to change your family history direction. It's a fascinating thing. So someone sends me a photo and they sign up for one of my consults. They're 15 minutes in length. And I joke, you know, give me 15 minutes and I'll change the direction of your research. And we look at those family photographs and I ask them a series of questions. And the questions are things like, you know, what do you remember about a picture? And there's always something that pops into someone's head that they haven't remembered until just that moment. Hmm. which makes it really exciting because they say, well, in fact, the first time I saw that picture, it was at so-and-so's house and we were doing this and they told me that. Or, oh, wait a minute, I think I have that piece of jewelry in my jewelry box. We talk about it and we talk about their family history and nine times out of ten, it fits together quite nicely. Quickly. Here's a list of people these pictures can be. This is when they were taken based on what people are wearing, the family history, the details in the picture, and what other research turns up in the process. So 
and photographs are so important for genealogy, as we all know. I was working on a case just this last week, and I was double-checking the person's research because that's part of the service. And I was looking at their research, and I said, huh, let me just hack around online and see if I can find any new information because there's new documents all the time. And what do you know? I broke her 30-year brick wall. Ooh. (laughs) Ooh, 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 ooh. You were probably as excited as she was. I called her up immediately, and I said, you have to check my work because I can't imagine. This is a very accomplished genealogist. She's done this for a very long time. I said, how could I have broken this case when you've worked on it for, for years and years? And that's what genealogy is all about. That sort of pay it forward moment. Don't you think sometimes we put blinders on ourselves, though? We start making assumptions in the past that, oh, I can't find it. And then we're just not looking in the same way we would as if it were a fresh case. Well, exactly. I do it myself. Sure. We've all done it. You get a mindset that it isn't out there. You can't find it. You've looked and looked and looked. It might not be there. And then a fresh set of eyes says, Did you notice that? Yeah, right. (laughs) Right. Well, let's talk about some of the old 19th century photographs and some of the things you're able to do with those, because I think that's really quite fascinating to people. Styles changed even in that era, much as they do today for both women and for men. And I know that's an important part of how you identify unmarked photos. That's right. You can't overlook the fashion clues. And there are details in every decade sometimes within a specific year. You know, if you Hmm. think about what the fashion trends are right now, today, (laughs) they might not be the same fashion trend next year. Remember Nehru jackets? I mean, I think they were in for like a week in 1967, right? I do. I do, unfortunately. So this kind of thing, you know, it, it changes quite a bit for men and for women. Now, there are people who dress conservatively, and so they may hold on to their favorite style of clothing a little bit longer. And there are people who change their, young women in particular, who change their fashion style to keep up with the times. So in terms of, let's say, the 1890s, you can tell a lot about when a person, a woman particularly, had her picture taken in the 1890s by the shape of her sleeve. Really? The size of it, the direction of it, because it's always a puff. Well, recently there was a story in the Smithsonian talking about how tuberculosis affected fashion back in the day. Did you see that article? I did see it. And it just blew my mind because I guess uh, the effects of tuberculosis actually affected a woman in a way that was deemed to be beautiful at that time. Pale, really skinny, (laughs) and wasting away. And so they built fashion around it also to keep the dresses off the floor so it wouldn't pick up all the germs. And then that affected the shoes and the styles of shoes going into the early 20th century. Amazing. Exactly. Fashion doesn't just pop out of nowhere. It's an influence from whatever else is happening in society. And so do you have a list of things from each year that was unique to that particular time period? I'm sure the Civil War had special styles that were quite different from the 1870s, even though as we might look back on it, it seems much the same period. I do. I have, you know, I've been working on photographs for a long time now, so I have a lot of this information in my head. But I also have a pretty good library here in my office of of all kinds of little bits and bobs about the history of photography and when photographers were in business and fashion, of course. I have many, many fashion encyclopedias in my office because there's always something that I see in a picture that I may never have seen before. Well, and we were talking off air before uh, we came on about people who throw away old photographs because they can't identify them and what a physical sickness that brings on you when you just think about that. You are doing something about that. And uh, the photo detective lost and found. Tell us about that and what people should be doing with their unidentified photos. Okay. So first off, three times in the last month, three different individuals told me that they had either seen somebody throwing out their family photographs or after they met me, they looked, they said, maybe I shouldn't have done that. I didn't realize that you could tell the clues in the pictures and they had tossed them as well. So I'm on this mission to bring photographs back into families, especially if people aren't interested in keeping them. Please don't throw them out. Please contact me before you do so. 
and we'll brainstorm some ideas on what you can do. So on Instagram, I have a new Instagram account or a fairly new Instagram account where I'm posting photographs from my own collection, but I could easily post other people's as well. And I may extend this into Facebook as well where I'm posting images that I have found that have a name on them. And there's a lot of people that do this. It's called the orphan photo movement. But I'm using the hashtags in Instagram as sort of index points. I don't know if you think about an old card catalog, subject headings. Sure. So that somebody could go in and search the hashtags for a particular surname and come up with a list of them that I've posted on Instagram. And then... I'm dating all the photographs, which is something that doesn't always occur on some other websites. So I'm using my photo detective skills to also then reach out to those descendants of those individuals. So if you get an email from me, if you're <laughs> listening, and you get an email from me that says, by the way, I have a picture of your great-grandparents, it's not a scam. <laughs> I How really cool is that? give it back. So we go to the Photo Detective Instagram account. We go to Photo Detective Instagram, and I post, I think, three times a week at this point. And all of those will eventually be featured in my website blog on MaureenTaylor.com. Okay. And they also go over to Pinterest, Photo Detective, and find some things. How about Flickr? I am not on Flickr. Okay. So Instagram and, and Pinterest. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest. All right. She's the photo detective. She's Maureen Taylor. You can find out all about her at MaureenTaylor.com. Once again, you got the photo detective lost and found for your unmarked photos. You want to get them to her through the Instagram account or through Pinterest or through Facebook. You're all over the place. I am all over the place. And can I make one last pitch before we... Please. Begin? Yes. So on my blog... On my website, which if you go to MaureenTaylor.com, there's a click where you can click on my blog. I have been working on some really complicated photo mysteries. And everybody out there, including many of your listeners, may have a piece of information to help me solve this photo mystery. I now know that these women who were in the military were, were in the military in the U.S. Army Corps. They were in Maxfield Air Force Base in Montgomery, Alabama. But I do not know their names, and I find it hard to believe that someone out there doesn't recognize one of the women in those photographs. So please take a look. Let me know if you recognize any of those faces. All right. Thanks so much, Maureen. Hopefully you're going to get that solved, and we can help a lot of other people solve their mysteries with their photographs at home. Great having you on. Thank you. And coming up next, of course, every family has a family legend that needs a little exploration. We have kind of a national family legend that we're going to get into with Andrew Cray from NEHGS, The Legend of Molly Pitcher, in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. Zap the grandma gap .com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file 
style and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. You know, just a few weeks ago, it was the 238th anniversary of the Battle of Monmouth in the Revolutionary War, June 28, 1778. Hyas Fisher and uh, one of my ancestors, Samuel Pease, who lived in nearby Freehold, New Jersey, was a part of that. And as a result of looking into the Battle of Monmouth in my own studies, I ran across this incredible article in a blog, the Vita Brevis blog with the New England Historic Genealogical Society, from my next guest, Andrew Cray, who is a senior researcher there. Andrew, how are you? Nice to have you on the show. Hi, Fisher. Thanks so much. I'm very happy to be here. So you've been researching into one of the great sub-stories of the Battle of Monmouth. And the Battle of Monmouth, by the way, was one of the final battles of the Revolution. It kind of put an end to British hopes of winning the war. And in the middle of all this was supposedly, theoretically, historically, a woman. And she was nicknamed Molly Pitcher. Now, Molly, of course, is a nickname for the given name of Mary, especially back in those times. So a lot of people think that her name may have actually been Mary something. And uh, you decided to dig into this and see if you could actually put a name on this mythical person or this this actual person who was out uh, giving water to the soldiers and, and helping fire the cannon, supposedly dressed in men's clothing. She was quite a woman. What can you add, by the way, to my description here, Andrew? I can add some things like she smoked and chewed tobacco and swore like the, the best of them. <laughs> Aha! Okay. <laughs> so Molly Pitcher became really quite the legend, and, and we still hear about her to this day. There are all kinds of illustrations of her especially through the late 18th and into the 19th century. And I guess it's been some kind of, shall we call it a mystery or debate as to her actual identity, or is it simply a matter of she's a conglomeration of several people who participated in the Battle of Monmouth that day? Yes, that is definitely the question. Um, There's many theories out there. I believe it's just a conglomerate of various women. When I started looking into this, I found it fascinating that there are some actual women on file who were paid pensions by the both local, state, and federal government wow. for service in the Revolutionary War, and I had no idea about that. Um, I Chris, didn't either. I've never, I've, I've never run into anything like that. Yeah, it's very few. Um, I believe in a few of the sources I checked, most people find maybe three to five women in the general New Jersey area that I happen to be researching throughout the entire war that actually received pensions. But still, I didn't even know if two or three women, I didn't even know about that at the time. Right. So you started digging into this to see if you could put a name on this individual, and what did you learn? I learned from, first of all, I want to say that I learned from an article written in 1999 by Emily J. Teepee. She has an article entitled, Will the Real Molly Pitcher Please Stand Up? in Prologue Magazine, which is online at the National Archives website. And... While reading her article, I learned that most researchers can boil it down to perhaps three different women that may have been Molly Pitcher or, as we mentioned, might be a conglomerate of all of them. Uh, The first is a woman named Mary Ludwig Hayes. And the first name Mary, as you mentioned earlier, Fisher, Molly is the nickname for that. So that lends credence to the fact that this could be uh, the actual Molly Pitcher. Sure. She was the daughter of German immigrants. And her husband was a captain in Francis Proctor's company in the Pennsylvania Artillery. Her husband was John Hayes. So because her husband was a captain and they didn't have children at the time, she fought alongside her husband. And she has an official Revolutionary War record. She certainly participated in the Battle of Monmouth. She supplied soldiers with drinking water, as you mentioned earlier. I believe that's how she earned the nickname Molly Pitcher, bringing pitchers of water to people. Sure. And... Supposedly, there are reports that she may have received thanks directly from General George Washington, but that's sort of more of a family lore type of situation. She was actually at uh, Valley Forge, too, right? She was a camp follower there. Yes, good point. She collected an annual pension of $40 from the state of Pennsylvania. 
So this is a, a likely candidate. And also in my research, when I wrote this blog post, some people commented on my blog post and happened to mention that there is a memorial but right next to Mary Ludwig Hayes' gravestone. There's a memorial to her remarking that she is Molly Pitcher. So fascinating. I mean, anyone, anyone, you know, anyone can put a memorial right. anywhere, but sure. But it's very, it's, it's just interesting that all those factors come together. So the second woman who Molly Pitcher may be was a woman named Mar- Margaret Cochran Corbin. She was the daughter of Robert Cochran, and she was the wife of John Corbin. John Corbin enlisted in the same company, Captain Francis Proctor's company, in the Pennsylvania Artillery. So her situation, the reason that she's another good candidate is her situation mirrors and follows Mary Ludwig Hayes very similarly. They were in the same company, and their husbands were in the, were in the military, and they followed their husband into battle, basically. And Margaret Corbin also received disability pay for her services. So she's um, another one who got the pay, and she was also in the Battle of Monmouth. This is crazy. Yes. Because it, it certainly breaks the stereotype, right, that it was all men, and, um, and these were very active women in this battle. Yes, exactly. And the descriptions are, of them are fantastic. I, I mentioned earlier, but I'll, I'll reiterate, Mary Ludwig Hayes was described as, and I quote, um, a rough, tough woman who reportedly smoked and chewed tobacco and swore like a trooper. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That, that description that description alone is, is, is worth, you know, I can picture her in my mind. <laughs> yeah. I mean, these are tough women. Absolutely. You wouldn't yeah. want to run into them in a back alley. Especially with a cannon. No. No. <laughs> right. And they had cannons. They had guns and things. Yes, I know. I know. So the main reason I mentioned both Mary Ludwig Hayes and Margaret Corbin is because I believe that their situations were mirrored and so similar that uh, they're both excellent candidates to be the real Molly Pitcher. Right, except that Margaret is really not a, a name from which Molly would come. Exactly. Good point. Right. Okay. Excellent point. Yes. Yep. Now, the third and, in my opinion, least likely candidate, her first name is Deborah, so that's even less of a nickname of Molly than, than Margaret. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> at, least Margaret, at least Margaret begins with an M, but but uh, the, the third candidate that myself and, and mostly other researchers have found in the past was a woman named Deborah Sampson. She is reported to have actually disguised herself as a man, cut her hair really short, and dressed up as a man to sign up, basically out of patriotism, and, and she thought it was her duty. Um, and she signed up with the 4th Massachusetts Regiment, where she was nicknamed, again, supposedly nicknamed Molly because of her high voice. Hmm. And her gir- and her girlish complex- complexion compared to all the other <laughs> compared to the other men fighting along next to her who must have had beards and you know beards and so forth. So she received a federal pension for her service also, and eventually she settled in Massachusetts and had three children and so forth. But I mean, she seems like a possible viable candidate as well. But the least likely of the three, who do you think it is? In my humble opinion, I think it's Mary Ludwig Hayes. Because of the name Molly and because, her, you know, her family, the generations that followed her are, are adamant about her service and the plaques along, you know, side of her gravestones and things like that. Just a, just a sort of a gut feeling on, on my side. There's no, you know, no true evidence that she was actually Molly Pitcher. Well, you know, it's a lot of fun, too. You can apply all that you're doing to any one of our family history stories, right? There are legends in everybody's family, and it takes Absolutely. this kind of effort to kind of get a handle on what's real, what's not, and what might have been. And I certainly think that's the case here because it could have easily been a conglomeration of all these three women and maybe some others we don't even know about. That's the thing. I agree 100%. It's probably even many, many more women that we don't know about because as I found all this information, I, I mentioned three that were actually paid by the government. So I was shocked that you know there are so many women out there that may have participated in the battles. He's Andrew Cray. He's a senior researcher for the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Thanks for coming on and talking about this, Andrew. Enjoyed it. Oh, Fisher, my pleasure. And this segment of Extreme Genes has been brought to you by FamilySearch.org. And coming up in three minutes, we'll talk to our preservation authority, Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com, about your questions about preserving your precious heirlooms and documents. That's in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show.
Legacy Tree Genealogists is a proud sponsor of Extreme Genes. Based in Salt Lake City, Utah, near the world's largest family history library, we've been working with genealogists all over the globe since 2004 to track down records, find your ancestors, and the stories that bring your legacy to life. We also analyze DNA test results, help you join lineage societies, and find missing cousins or heirs to property. Legacy Tree is the recommended research partner of MyHeritage.com and is the world's highest client-rated genealogy firm. Call us toll-free at 1-800-818-1476. Call now or register online to get a free estimate. Learn from our free genealogy tips on our blog at LegacyTree.com slash blog. Even experienced researchers can benefit from our proven and experienced staff of specialists who can bring new approaches to old problems. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. LegacyTree.com. When someone asks, what is forever.com, I tell them it's a new kind of digital storage, like for your photos and documents and all the family memories. And they always shoot back with, well, that's not a very new thing. There's Facebook, Shutterfly, Flickr. Then I say, oh, but on forever, you own all your content. There's no third party ads and it's guaranteed for your lifetime, plus 100 years. Do the others do that? Okay, so like I said, forever.com, a new kind of digital storage. You are the chief memory officer of your family. You get that frantic phone call about the reunion in two days and they need the slideshow. And you're ready because you use forever.com. Photos, news clippings, heck, you automatically upload the photos on your cell phone every day. You have everything digitally stored and organized where you can share it privately with your friends and family. No ads and it's permanent, guaranteed for generations. Yes, you are the chief memory officer and you have forever.com. Did you know that FamilySearch Family Tree is available through a powerful new mobile app experience? That's right. Now you can view, edit, and even add information to ancestors in your family tree whenever and wherever you are. You no longer need to wait to get home or make a date with your computer to view or update your family tree. You can add details to your tree when visiting with family or when capturing details from a trip to the cemetery. You can share new family history discoveries from classroom settings. You can even make the most of your time when waiting for doctor appointments or car repairs. Get started today by downloading the free Family Search Family Tree app to your Apple or Android device. Visit familysearch.org/treeapp to get the Family Tree app for free. Exploring and expanding your family tree has never been more convenient. Visit familysearch.org/treeapp to download the Family Search Family Tree mobile app today. It is Preservation Time on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show, and this segment is brought to you by Forever.com. Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com is here. How are you, Tommy? Super duper. Got a great email here from Ryan McMichael, and I love this. He says, my mom came across a single 25-foot roll of old 8-millimeter film. He does old all in caps, and he says, the catch I'm not sure it was ever processed, and I'm a little nervous about checking because I don't want to expose it to light. If it hasn't been processed, (laughs) is there any hope at all of anything useful coming of it if the process before date is February 1957. <laughs> he says, are you done laughing yet? <laughs> I just got started. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, where do we go with this one, Tom? All right. That's a really good question. We'll talk about a couple different ways to do this. Sounds like nothing to lose. Oh, no. Yeah, you have nothing to lose but a few bucks, so to speak. Yeah, he actually, which is smart. When you write to me with weird stuff, take a photo of it with your phone and attach it. Because I would have to question him, but he actually sent a picture of the box. He also sent a picture of the can inside. This is definitely regular eight. And in the old days, you had this little can that was 16 millimeters wide. You'd put it in your regular eight camera and you'd shoot it till you got to the end of the roll. Then you'd pop out the reel, pop back in the opposite way, and then run it again. And then what you're supposed to do, send it into Kodak, have them develop it. Once they develop it, they split it into two eight millimeter reel. So then you can watch the 10 minutes that you've just recorded. But in his case, he shows a picture of the can with the black tape still on it. If the tape looks like it's never, ever come off of it, chances are it's never been shot. However, to me, it's worth the money to take the chance. 
we don't physically do it in our store because Kodak doesn't even make the chemistry anymore. <laughs> right. But there is a place that's called Film Rescue. Just go and Google the word Film Rescue. They're actually in Canada, but they also have a shop in the U.S. I believe it's in Michigan. And you can send the stuff to them. They take it across the border so you don't have to worry about customs or anything. And they only do it a couple times a year because they have to make their own chemistry. So what I would do is do exactly what this gentleman did, send them a copy of the box, or it'll say chemistry C41 or whatever. Say, I've got one reel of this. They'll give you a quote of what it would cost to develop it when you want to get it in so you can make sure you make one of their deadlines. Is it pricey? It generally runs. I've seen it go as high as $50 a reel, depending on how many it is. But if you have like 10 reels, it's not going to cost you $50 for each reel. Right. So go in there, find out. Some of the chemistries are less expensive to make. Some of them are, are very expensive. But find out. I mean, he's had it for longer than I've been alive. <laughs> so, I mean, if he has to wait another six months or even a year, it's probably not going to be a, a situation. This goes back to the Eisenhower administration. It does. So I guess the question would be, Tom, how old is the oldest bit of film that you've actually developed? I mean, as far as how far back it went. I would actually have to look at our stuff. We've got stuff from, you know, the Candy Bomber from World War II. We did all of his film for him. We've got some video that I've watched that you see like 1920 uh, Model A Forge driving by. So, you know, it's got to be older than that. Right. But you did film. You oh, actually yeah. processed film that hadn't been processed before. Oh, Absolutely. Back in the day, you know, in fact, it's funny about you said our third anniversary last week. It was our 43rd anniversary for us last month. And so we've been doing this forever. And in the old days, these guys at Film Rescue, they used to do film for us once a month. Wow. We would get it a lot and would get it, send it back to them. They would develop it for us, send it to us. And also, if you have the newer kind that's in the little hard plastic things and you can actually see a little bit of the film hanging in the cassette, we have people bringing those in today, too. And on those kind of films, in the little plastic black cartridges, you'll see a little bit of film. And if it has the white words exposed on it, yes, the whole roll has been exposed. If it doesn't say exposed, you really don't know if it's at the beginning of the roll or the end of the roll. And so after the break, I'll come back and tell you some little ways you can find out if it has been exposed or if it hasn't been exposed. All right. Really interesting stuff. Great question, too. We'll be back in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chartmasters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartmasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chartmasters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight, they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to Transfer Duplication. Com. Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that 
meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com, provide your saliva sample from home, and mail it back to a CLIA certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. And we are back. Final segment of Extreme Genes, America's family history show and ExtremeGenes.com. I am Fisher, your radio root sleuth with Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com, the Preservation Authority. Tom, some exciting events coming up. I know you're going to be at some of these if people would like to visit with you personally. It's awesome because a lot of times you can come up with your questions, bring things and show them to me because it's a lot easier sometimes to see something when somebody's describing it to you. And I can give you some tips and tricks to transfer it yourself or Give you some leads of where you can go. All right. We've got uh, the Scandinavian and German Research Expo at the Nebraska Prairie Museum. That's in Holdridge, Nebraska, coming up August 25th through 27th. I know you're still making plans on that one to see if you can be there. There is Salt Lake City Family History Library Research Week in Salt Lake City, Utah, October 10th through 14th. And then there's also one in Midway, Utah. And I know you're going to be a part of that one. What's the story on that one, Tom? This is one of my favorite ones to do because it's a little bit smaller. It's kind of like a mini Roots Tech. So you have chances to go and talk to the exhibitors. You have a chance to go and talk to the presenters. So it's an awesome opportunity. You can go to Family History Expos with an S dot com. It's at the homestead in Midway, Utah, which is absolutely picturesque. It's one of the most beautiful places in Utah. It's wonderful. It's November 11th and 12th. Hope to see you there. All right. Getting back to Ryan's question here that we were getting into last segment, and I love this, about processing old home movies from 1957. It was never processed, and he wants to find out more about this. And you you had some other direction you wanted to take this. Exactly. So we've covered his, which is the old 16 millimeter, which they split into two eights. If you have the cartridges, the little black cartridges that just go right into the Super 8 cameras generally, if you see it and it doesn't say exposed and you're not sure, do I want to send this and develop it? One thing you can do is go into a dark room and make a little mark on it with like a, a grease pencil and go into a dark room and get like a screwdriver and kind of turn the crank and see how far it goes. If it goes for a long, long ways, then it's probably never been exposed. If it goes a short time and mm, it's not moving anymore and you can see the word exposed, then it's at the end of the reel. Then you know it's almost done. And, and so the, the flashlight, though, wouldn't cause any damage because you're at the end of the reel, right? Right, exactly. And the thing is, even if you turn it on at some other time, all you're going to lose is like about a one-inch section, which is like a fraction of a second. Right. So if you want to put a mark on it, in fact, if you have a, a red light, it won't even expose the film at all. And then you can actually see it moving and see how long it takes to move. If you're really tight on dollars or you found a whole drawer of these. If the box itself is sealed from the factory, I guarantee nobody's ever done anything with it, so it's not even worth using. You know, I would always take the gamble and develop it just to see because you never know what's going to be on it. It's not that big of an expense, but it makes it kind of cool. If you're really tight financially and you found a lot of these, this is just a simple trick to go and find out, hey, how close am I to the end? Because in the old days, just like today, people sometimes would keep one roll when for Christmas, they keep another one for birthdays, another one for their vacations. And when they're done with that, they take the cartridge out, put in another cartridge. And then when it goes to Christmas again, they put in the Christmas cartridge till the whole thing is shot. And so quite a number of times you'll find one that never, ever got to the end. So it says exposed. So this is just a cheap trick to kind of find out how close it is to the end. Boy, I had no idea there was so much to this. And you're right. I actually found in an old family Bible once a negative of a photograph. And I was able to take that and put it on a scanner scan it, and then reverse it, because of course it was a negative, made it into a positive, and I was able to see the photograph from it. But these things are out there. Oh, absolutely. And one thing that you bring up that's really wonderful is you can get color negatives and scan them. And if you're scanning them at home and don't have the right kind of a scanner, there's software and apps you can go out and turn it into a regular positive. 
Great stuff. Thanks so much, Tom. Talk to you again next week. Great to be here. Hey, that wraps up our show for this week. This segment has been brought to you by MyHeritage.com and our friends at RootsMagic.com. And by the way, if you get on our Facebook page or ExtremeGenes.com, you can now sign up for our new weekly newsletter, The Weekly Genie. No, we will not be spamming you, just giving you great information to help you with your family research. Thanks so much for joining us. Take care. We'll talk to you again next week. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. 